So I'd like to shift gears a bit from plant health into human health with focus on one particular species, uh, a species that hopefully we'll get some of uh, this evening, uh, in the tonic, if you get, go for a gin and tonic. And it's uh, a story about the, the quinine or the fever tree. And it's a, it's a large collaboration involving many people here at Kew and in many different uh, countries as well uh, and our collaborators uh, in South America. So shifting from the UK into South America, but back and forth a few times. The, the quinine is uh, one of the most fascinating stories, I think, in uh, our exploration of plants and their benefits to humans. Uh, and it all starts with this statement that in Loja grows a tree, uh, which the locals call fever tree. The bark from this tree has the color of cinnamon and mixed in a drink, and that's not gin and tonic, <laughs> but it's, it's just water, it cures fevers. So that was a very interesting statement. And as we, as we probably all know here, uh, uh, cinchona bark or quinine is actually uh, the medicine that pro probably saved most lives in human history. It was the only treatment against malaria for more than 300 years. But it's an interesting story because um, it's also a complicated one. We know that uh, the understanding of quinine and effects on humans uh, is quite complex. Uh, we know this story has a lot of unreliable reports uh, from the early phase, um, you know, through the centuries, really. It's also a story of imperial uh, history and colonization and exploitation, uh, not always in the nicest way. It's also been a huge challenge for plant hun hunters, really looking for the medicine that would cure the millions of Europeans being affected by uh, malaria, malaria in Europe uh, a few hundred years ago. And it's also a story of uh, a lot of botanical confusion. When I did my PhD thesis, my uh, previous supervisor, he, he looked at hundreds of different names and concluded that there were no more than a, just a couple of dozen species. And it's been uh, a big confusion in terms of how many species there are of the quinine tree and uh, how to call them. And also a story uh, that probably involves variation within particular species. So it's not only about identifying the species that has the best potential, but also identifying uh, how much variation there is within uh, those. And it all started again uh, here in Loja, which is in uh, Ecuador. And this is how the flowers look like. It's uh, relative to, to the coffee, so it's in the coffee family, a huge uh, family in the tropics. And the first uh, report of uh, someone actually finding those seeds and bringing them back to Europe was by Richard Spruce, who was sent from the UK to collect seeds of uh, cinchona. And what he did was to go to Limon, just a bit north of Loja, which is where this first statement comes from. And then he collected the red quinine, so the red um, uh, cinchona pubescence. And as you see here in, in, in that figure, it's something that uh, then made it into uh, plantations in Sri Lanka. And because uh, Spruce made so much money out of this and was such a successful story, uh, it really uh, captivated the attention of other people, including uh, the collections that Mamami did in South America. And he brought back seeds from another uh, species yet called Cinchona calisaya, which is much more yellowish. And that's actually probably one of the biggest mistakes the British ever did because they said, no, thank you, we already have seeds. <laughs> so they turned down, basically, uh, buying those seeds because they already had them. They were plant planting them uh, in Sri Lanka. What they didn't know is that it was a completely different species. And, you know, uh, let's see how it turns out in terms of which one is the best one. But what we know now is that the Dutch totally uh, took over the market, the work market, and supply of quinine uh, for the treat treatment of malaria. But the question I'd like to ask you in this, in this project and um, that we've been pursuing now for over 15 years is a quite simple one. Did the indigenous communities in South America and plant hunters who came later find the best cinchona? Or is it still out there? If you just imagine, South America is a big continent. How many of you have been to South America here? Let's see. Quite a few of you. It's huge. And diversity is huge. As you see those vast forests, are humans able to actually explore all the diversity here and the different uses of plants? So we embarked on this mission and uh, for our help, we were thinking about using uh, the relatedness among species, so phylogenetic information to really help us guide where to look for the best uh, quinine tree. And uh, one of my best friends and colleagues, uh, Nina Ronstadt, who many of you uh, here will know, 
she's been working very much in terms of understanding how phylogenetic trees can help you uh, guide where to explore properties of species. So this is work that uh, Nina and Owen um, uh, Grace sitting here has been really doing very interesting work in terms of understanding uh, how particular clades contain substances and then instead of exploring randomly across the tree of life, focusing on those. So we knew that with a good phylogeny, we will be on the way. But the problem was that we had very few species uh, that had been sequenced. So this is our, my first ever paper published uh, as a PhD student. We had very few people, uh, species in phylogeny and no chemical profiles for those species. So it's something that really uh, didn't allow us to pursue further in terms of exploring the best uh, species. And that's when I contacted Nina and asked whether we could try to put something together to really go and explore again uh, on the quest for Cinchona. So I just want to show you a quick movie, if we can dim down the lights a bit. For many years now, researchers like myself have been studying all the possible remedies that could relieve human suffering and save lives from the deadly disease that is malaria. Today, malaria continues to be a major threat to human health, with the parasite continuing to develop resistance against all the available drugs. We are in a race against time to find the best cure. And it is in this battle against the parasite that I embarked on a journey to explore what has throughout most of human history been the most effective cure for malaria, the cinchona bark. I am Nina Rønsted, a professor and passionate nature explorer, and with me on this journey is a team of experts in botany, chemistry, microbiology and bioinformatics. Uh, a, a taste of what uh, we've been working on in terms of really getting together a whole bunch of people uh, to explore again uh, the quest for Cinchona. And uh, to our great help, we had uh, a Bolivian botanist, Carla Maldonado, who really went exploring, making collections across the whole of South America, especially in the Andes. And uh, what we know now is that there are about 120 different species in the tribe Cinchona. So that's the, you know, the group of genera most rela close related to, to Cinchona. And also within Cinchona, there are about 25 species. And uh, through the, uh, this exploration here, we both covered the areas that were originally collected in the historical collections, but also much beyond it. And we found uh, interesting alkaloids, so the compounds against malaria in several of those genera, in three different genera. And just to give you a sense of the, of the task here, you know, just look at South America on the map, it's usually not that big. But I just put uh, a map of Britain here, so the whole of the UK, uh, which is just that <coughs> tiny little thing, uh, you know, which doesn't uh, really <laughs> make it easier for, for people to actually go explore, in particular when you consider the difficulties of doing field work. So it's, it's been a huge amount of work um, behind this and a lot of people involved that I really want to acknowledge here. And of course, uh, things that are never as simple as you imagine, uh, we thought we had 25 species, but we've also been coming across new species. That's one of them that was described uh, during this exploration. Cinchona Andersoni, um, in, uh, to recognize uh, Leonard Anderson, who started this project. And um, we also have been doing a lot of uh, chemical profiles uh, using an HPLC UV uh, of more the four major alkaloids. So it's, it's quinine is one of them, but there are four different ones that have an effect against plasmodium, which is the parasite transmitting malaria. And really what we can see here on the top, on the curves, is that you can identify those uh, alkaloids by screening through different parts of the bark. And this is how the bark looks like. We take it at different heights. And this is really exciting because then we can directly associate the sequences to the specimens collected in the field. We've also been able to access the fantastic collections here at Kew. Uh, and those are historical collections, over a thousand different specimens, uh, which document over 150 years of collecting uh, and breeding as well, breeding experiments. Samples from vanished uh, forests. Um, we know that many of those forests where they were collected in the beginning disappeared afterwards. Also, historical annotations that were made uh, really back in time, about 200 years ago. And that's really exciting because we can actually compare those annotations, those measurements, 
to you know, modern uh, measurements made with new uh, techniques. And this is a work with, by Natalie, uh, Mark Nesbitt, and Kim here um, uh, at Q. We've also been, uh, most recently, uh, uh, looking into ways of exploring the full genome of those, spe those species, both to look at how different genes are expressed in their relation to different compounds, but also to ba make better phylogenetic trees. And this is uh, a photo from Ilya Leach and uh, Natalie, uh, very recently this year, doing a uh, third, se third generation sequencing of uh, cinchona. Uh, and this case, is, that's actually the first ever tree, a plastic tree made by, uh, assembled by Oscar Perez, sitting here today who uh, was able to, to really get a huge amount of data, in this case about 700 billion reads, uh, with about 20,000 uh, base pairs of, of each one of those, and the longest one is almost a million base pairs in one single fragment that was sequenced. That's a, a revolution in, you know, if, if, if you know something about DNA sequencing, that's actually a really uh, major achievement uh, in terms of DNA sequencing. And that's the first time it's ever done in the Coffey family. So to show you some results, and that's really the exciting part, uh, again, you know, when I started this project, I thought there's no way ever that indigenous people, you know, in those isolated valleys across the whole of South America, with no other tools than uh, their tongue and smell and try and error, would ever find a uh, species, that, you know, the best species among those. Uh, but they did. <laughs> And so far, it really seems that the, the species among all those 120 different species, the species that the indigenous people indicated to my mummy when he went collecting uh, was the right one. It was Cinchona calisaya, the, the uh, yellow-barked uh, quinine. And it really contains, as you see here, this chemical profiles, all the four alkaloids which are really shown to have an effect on plasmodium and malaria. So I think that's, that's really exciting because we are absolutely not expecting that. It really shows you know, the, the amazing capacity of humans of exploring the environment uh, with no other tools, no botanical knowledge, no phylogenies, no DNA sequences. Uh, in this case, it seems that they, they did the right thing. And also, we are now exploring how much variation there is within species because, as I, so, as I told you, um, it's not clear that one species will have exactly always the same amount. So within Cinchona calisaya, we've seen that the particular clades where relationship, so the, you know, the phylogenetic information and altitude along the mountains is what's determining the, the contents of those alkaloids. So uh, in conclusion, uh, Native Americans, they knew their remedies. We don't know whether this is something that applies for all of the different medicinal plants uh, used by indigenous communities. Uh, they've been there for about, uh, you know, something around 20,000 years uh, since they, they came from Bering Strait. They've been exploring a diversity that we don't quite know yet for South America, but perhaps around 110,000 plant species across the Neotropics uh, and also for different uses. We also know that the amount of alkaloids, uh, they vary within and among species, so which really showcase the importance of using the collections for, for this kind of exploration. We, we need, we've seen and we are studying now how phylogeny and altitude, so how the environment and history uh, influence the production of those compounds, but we don't quite know yet why those plants have that. Uh, so we are doing experiments looking at insects and herbivory. You know, we have different hypotheses, but we, we, we're not really sure. And uh, likely they, they must have a reason for that. And my, my last point is really why I think this fits so well into this symposium is that the traditional knowledge that we have, and we know also a lot of has been lost uh, because of you know, influence of um, Europeans and, and other colonizers, really devastating a lot of the indigenous knowledge. But this knowledge combined with our understanding of taxonomy, uh, relationship of species based on genomics and chemistry and the exploration of our collections is really something that will allow us to embark on a new exploration, new phase of exploration of properties of species uh, for a sustainable planet. Thank you.